Hey there, what's left of Dango Stew here? Today's video is about buying a secondhand boat and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. As many of you all know from Facebook and Instagram, I've been a little bit crook at the moment. So I've decided to pull out some old footage from when Paul bought his current boat. Although this video is predominantly going to focus on checking a second-hand boat that you're thinking about buying, the first step really is thinking about the type of boat you actually need. There's no point buying a boat or even looking at a boat if it's not fit for purpose. Where I live on the island, we mostly use boats just for commuting to and from the mainland, but obviously fishing is a big activity for most people, water skiing, just pleasure boating, going to beaches, that kind of thing. So make sure you've got a clear idea what you want to use the boat for first. Then have a think about how many people are likely to go. Is it just you, you and your mate, the whole family, that kind of thing? How old are the people? Are there people in their 70s and 80s? Are there young children, infants, that kind of thing? All these things that kind of influence your decision about the boat you go for. Paul had obviously found an ad for a boat he felt was right for him. And we'll pick this video up where we start heading up the coast to go and take a look at it. So I'm here with Paul. Oh, say hi. Hey. <laughs> and we're heading up the coast to have a look at, uh, look at a boat that Paul saw online. Now Paul being the organised guy he is, has actually made a bit of a checklist. Now this video we're going to be going through the things on that checklist, but I do think it's actually a really great idea to bring it with you just so you don't forget anything. I'll put a list similar to this checklist in the description of this video so you've got something you can cut and paste and print out for yourself. Well, I mean, I've, I've asked the seller if he's okay with me doing various inspections, including a compression test. Yep. And he seemed to have no problem with that. That's it, a good point, actually, confirming with him before you would make the trek. If you're going to go all the way up the coast. That's right, yeah. You don't want to get there and say, oh, look, is it all right if I start poking around your boat and say, no, nah, mate, you can start it and run it, but that's it. That's you know? it, so, yeah. No, know. that's actually well worth asking, isn't it? So. Yeah, you want to make sure. So, uh, uh, so that's a good point. So find one that you like make sure the price is in the ballpark, and then quiz the owner about the types of tests he's gonna let you do when you get there, so he doesn't just go, look, if you want it, you want it, if not, go away. That's the other pre-arrival thing is the tools you brought. So you brought a compression tester? I brought a compression tester. I so you to get the spark plugs out? Uh, some spark plug tools. I brought uh, just some general screwdrivers and bits and pieces. Yep. I also brought a two-way radio. Oh, okay. Uh, because the boat is fitted with a two-way radio, Oh, okay, so you can have a chat to it. Yeah, so I'd like to be able to test if that works, because if that doesn't work, well then that's something And you else. can be looking at the steering and saying, turn to port, and I can be at the mound. <laughs> that's and, right. <laughs> and I noticed you printed up a bit of a receipt, which we might have a look at later, because I think that's a really good tip as well. Yeah, I, um, I used a similar thing for the last car that I bought, uh, just a bit of a format to remind you uh, what details you need from the seller. Yep. And just, it looks, it looks a bit more professional if I'm bored. You're asking yeah. them for their license details and so yeah. on, and yours are on the same thing. Yep. Plus yeah. an extra, extra copy, if they want the same thing, you can yeah. write out too. Yep. You know, and yep. they can have a copy. No, it's a good idea. So here we are, the owner Wayne, really lovely guy, is more than happy for us to go and have a look over the whole boat. So we're just going to start with a bit of a hull inspection. I've got to say, so far, it looks immaculate. There's no obvious signs of any sort of electrolysis pitting, anything like that. Doesn't look like it's been beached much, if ever, either. So I'm looking for any damage. I mean, I'm noting these sections of corrosion underneath the paint. Yeah. Which is sort of everywhere. Um, which is not a massive issue, and I think it's quite common for boat like this it's a few years old. Accessories is an interesting thing with the price. You kind of go, okay, here's the hull, but mm. got a fish finder, got a radio. Mm. Which has some value provided you actually want them. The Subfloor fuel tank's another really interesting one. You yeah. sort of wonder how you... Yeah, you check that out. Yeah. There's a water separating fuel filter installed in this boat, which is good good for the health of the boater, but also means we can uh, take a look at that and check out if there's any water in it. Yeah. That's what I was hoping. Section there to get to. So there's your bilge pump, which is pretty nicely installed. Yeah, be more worried about any sort of obvious pitting than any than a, like an oxide layer. Mm. That's just what aluminium does. Yeah. 
When you look inside your hull, just have a look where the ribs join. That's where you're going to have any cracks if the hull's been flexing or anything. In this case, they look fine. So pitting as corrosion for the actual plate aluminium and cracks on the welds for the ribs. Particularly for the ribs, you're checking where they attach to the chine here and where they attach to the keel. In this case, they all look pretty good. So, so far, hull checks out pretty good. No obvious sign of impact damage and no sign of corrosion beyond what you'd expect from a boat of this vintage, about 10, 13 years old now. Vaguely related to our hull corrosion issues, or inspections anyway, is the anodes uh, on the outboard itself are in place and very healthy. One little knock here on the starboard side, but it's nothing to lose any sleep over. Also, when you're buying a boat motor combination, check the builder's plate on the hull to make sure that the outboard is well suited to the hull, isn't outside this maximum horsepower rating. In this case, the hull's rating is uh, maximum 100 horsepower and it's got a 90, so they're perfect for each other. Very cool little Briggs and Stratton winch. When you're looking over the hull, another thing to have a close look at is the trailer itself. They can be quite expensive to replace if it's got any serious issues with it. Trailer checks out pretty well. A little bit of rust on some of the rollers. Missing a stud on one of the wheels. But they're all things that are fixable. From a corrosion point of view, the other thing I always really look at is these steering yokes. This one's actually pretty good, but I've seen them completely rusted out. I think it's one of the only parts of these outboards that tends to be mild steel, not stainless or aluminium. Hull checked out pretty well, so we're going to start looking at the outboard. Uh, Paul's just going to whip the cowling off now and we'll just start having a bit of a visual inspection again and then we'll do a compression test on it. So the motor itself looks pretty tidy. No corrosion on it at all. A few things I'd be looking for is any real sort of salt leak, any sort of signs of some of these head gaskets failing. And they look pretty clean. There's no corrosion around these spark plugs either, which is nice. Particularly these lower ones tend to get pretty bad. Just gonna run a little bit of water through it now and start doing a compression test. Got this tester hooked up to cylinder number one. And then we'll crank it over and see what we get. So just pull the lanyard out before you crank it. Yep. Uh, and just lift the fast idle up. Yep. Go for it. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Yeah, 120. Cool. You right? Yep. Yeah, same. Now this is past its compression test, we're just going to get the water back on and fire it up for a bit. through the electrics a little bit so I'll just uh, do a walk around see what we see with lights. Yeah, yeah, right. Apparently lights are on but nothing on here. Once we'd finished all these visual and mechanical checks we took the boat out for an on-water test. I didn't actually film that test at the time but I'll go through now some of the things to look for. Before we do that though there's a couple of other things worth mentioning. One, I guess, is that if it's a four-stroke, I would also take a look at the oil in the four-stroke. So even just take the dipstick out, make sure the oil is not low, it's not burning oil, or it hasn't been run low, and also that there's no water in the oil. It's a really quick and easy check you can do that's well worth doing. I would also quiz the owner about the history. It sort of seems obvious, but it's easy to forget sometimes. They can often clue you into things, even things like, oh, the boat's been sitting for a few years, so you know the fuel in the tank's gonna be old, that kind of thing, particularly if the boat's got an in-floor tank. So it's worth asking those kind of questions. Also, as you could see earlier, this trailer was missing one of the wheel studs, which we replaced. Just picked one up from an auto parts store and popped that in. But it's also worth doing things like jacking it up, feeling the trailer wheel bearings. Last thing you want to do is hook the boat up you've just bought to your car and then find out that one of the wheels falls off on the way down the freeway or whatever. So well worth making sure the boat's kind of good to go before you do the onboard test. Both good to drive on the trailer and good to run with the fuel that's in it, etc. The boat we're in today actually isn't the boat that Paul bought, it's a different boat, but it's very similar in size and shape. I actually think the hull might be identical now I think about it, but this has a Mercury 4-stroke instead of a Yamaha 2-stroke.
obviously you will have gone through the process of launching the boat if it's a trailer boat and that'll give you some sense of how user friendly the trailer is and the winch and all that kind of setup but in this case we're already on the water now one of the first things i'd look at with a boat is just how stable it is you might have a vision of being in a boat and fishing and a few of you walking around but if i get up on this boat it's quite a large boat five meters so it's pretty comfortable with this boat for example i can sit right on the gunnel like this sitting right on the edge it hardly moves it's quite beamy it's quite long and that might be how you pictured your life in a boat being quite stable like this suddenly you get in a boat with a bit of a deeper v a narrower beam and you might be quite surprised at how tender it is how much the boat rolls as people move around and so it's really worth getting a sense of that before you commit one of the other things you can do when you put a boat in the water particularly if it was dry on the trailer is see if any water's coming into the bilge you might have to lift a floorboard like this to have a look under into the bilge given the hull that paul bought looked nice on the trailer i wouldn't consider a leak water coming in catastrophic you know it's one of those things where you might use as a bargaining point but it's unlikely to be something that can't be repaired it might be a leaking bung it could be a small pinhole but there wasn't sign of electrolysis through the hull and that's the kind of thing that you really can't repair very well so just see if there's water see if you can figure out where it's coming in from and then sort of make a decision whether it's a real problem or just something that can be fixed with a bit of sikaflex so when you go to start the boat there's a few things you'll know straight away. Is it easy to start? You know, we started on the trailer, but how does it start in the water when there's back pressure on the exhaust? So does it start easily, particularly when it's cold? Is the idle steady and at a good sort of, you know, 800,000 RPM, whatever? Bear in mind, if you've got the choke on or it's got a cold start, it may start high until it's warm and then drop down. Then as you accelerate, does it accelerate smoothly? Does it sort of bog down? Feel like it's starving for fuel, that kind of thing? And then when you're up to full throttle, is it running at about five, five and a half thousand RPM? If it's not, then there's a few things that could be wrong. It could be that it's just not powerful enough for the hull. The hull might be dirty. In this case, with river boats, they often get barnacles, which will slow a boat down a lot. It could be that the motor itself's down on power, that it was originally powerful enough to push the hull, but now it's, you know, lost compression or something like that. So just see whether you get to that sort of sweet spot of about five, five and a half thousand. Generally, whatever the close to the red line is for the motor you're buying. So what I'll do is I'll start this boat up now and we'll go for a bit of a run. And what you're looking at once you're on the water is how does the boat sit? Does it just sit bow up? Is it out of balance? Does it porpoise? Does the front of the boat sort of bounce around? Play with the trim if it's got an electric trim so you can see whether that gives you the result you're after. I mean, it may just be well out of trim, so don't write the hull off straight away. But not all boats ride as nicely as you'd hope. So we've done our static test of walking around side to side, front to back, just seeing how stable the boat is. Now we're gonna see how it rides under power. As you'd expect with a almost near new motor, started nicely, idles well. It's an EFI four stroke, so it's a really nice idling motor. Good telltale, kind of what you'd expect with this boat. But with an older motor, obviously you're gonna get a different result. All right, so we'll accelerate from here. We're now doing about 1500 RPM. This is a five meter boat and a 90 horsepower Mercury and pulled out of the water nicely. A little bit of bow up as you take off, but that's pretty normal. Then sat at about 5,000 RPM until I trimmed it up a little bit, which got us to our five and a half without any sort of ventilation and also got the bow up a little bit in the rear quite nicely. So as far as an on-water test goes, you'd have to say this hull passed with flying colors. If it's struggling, digging the stern in, porpoising, whatever, I don't know, it's pretty uncomfortable to live with a boat that doesn't behave nicely. So I'd really think hard about whether this boat's sort of gonna suit you if it does have some of those characteristics. Look, if you're just looking to get out and have a little bit of a fish, you're gonna be sitting at anchor or drifting and fishing. You're not going too far and the price is right. Yeah, maybe, but just think hard about whether you can live with those handling characteristics for the life of the boat. You might find you can redistribute the weight a little bit, but other than buying a whole new outboard for it, you know, you're kind of stuck with it. Sometimes though, the outboard's pretty clapped out and it's 
essentially free. Really what you're buying is the hull, and that's a different story again. So just be sure what you're getting into. All right, once you've decided that you want the boat, then Paul had prepared a special receipt. So what you're looking at doing there is just getting a full receipt to make sure you actually own the boat once you've bought it. And that can involve things like doing a check. You want to make sure that there's no money owing on the boat and you want to make sure the boat's not stolen. And there are online government sites and things. I'll try and find a link and put it on the description of the video for checking those things before you commit to buying it and handing your money over. When Paul bought this boat, he went down the road and got a bank check, which I think is a good way to go. It's a little bit safer, I think, than handing cash over, but the person selling the boat doesn't have any risk that the check's gonna bounce. Well, thanks for watching. I hope this video helps you if you are thinking about buying a second-hand boat soon, give you an idea of some of the things you should look for and some of the things you should check. There's bound to be other things you should check that I've forgotten about, so feel free to comment in the description below, and I'll catch you next week. See ya.